Hello and welcome back to the free online woodworking school. In this video, we're primarily gonna be focusing on preparing this table for glue up. So while we could just jump in, slap a load of glue on this and get it assembled, like most things in woodworking, if we put in a bit more time up front, we can make the future versions of ourselves have a much easier time and much more grateful to our past selves. So firstly, the obvious thing is general cleanup of the inside faces, but not only that, these outside faces as well. Because of these steps created by the legs, cleaning into these corners is gonna be very difficult with whatever method we use. Likewise, the inside faces of these legs as well could do with a little bit of cleanup. We've also got the inside front rail and the underside of the top rail. You know, again, internal corners, gonna be tricky to access once this is all solid. And uh, <laughs> I've got this pen mark that I so conveniently wrote on the back, which I could just keep there, but I should probably get rid of it. But in addition to cleanup, within the cavity, we've also got some draw runners to add along the bottom and along the top. These could just be glued into this inside face if we wanted, but that can get a little bit messy. It might be difficult to clamp accurately because these draw runners need to be perfectly aligned with this front rail. And not only that, they need to be parallel across both sides so that the draw has a parallel cavity to go into. And we also need to get some on these top edges as well, which are parallel to the ones on these bottom edges. And finally, we need to plan out a few fixing points within this carcass so that we can attach the top later. We don't wanna have this all glued together and then try and find ways of like, screwing or bracketing this from the underside without it kind of being considered beforehand. And so I've got a nice plan for that coming up. But to begin with, the first thing we're gonna focus on is the draw runners. And I'm actually gonna show you three ways of attaching these draw runners so that you've got a choice of which one you want to choose depending on your confidence of the joinery that we've done up until this point. Let me explain. So here's a kind of section of the draw runner that we're gonna be adding to this table. And you might remember when we were cutting the lower rail and the upper rail, I was very, very careful about where the locations of both of these were. With regards to the bottom rail, the underside of it needs to be perfectly in line with the underside of these side rails. Likewise, the top one needs to be perfectly flush with the top of the leg, as do these side rails as well. The reason for that is because these draw runners, what we want to be able to do is fix them into position so they're perfectly flush with the underside of these side rails. And in doing so, you end up with a seamless joint on this front face and so that the draw runs over it very smoothly. You can imagine that if this bottom rail was slightly too low or slightly too high and we glue this draw runner into the side so that it's flush with the bottom, we'll probably end up with a step at the front like that, that the draw's got to kind of get over or it'll end up with a drop, which is slightly better than having a step like this, but even so it might end up pinching towards the back. And so if you're confident that these rails are all in the right positions, then we can just go ahead and either screw these into position being flush with the underside of the side rails that's a bit of a tongue fall wouldn't it or you could even go ahead and biscuit or domino them if you've got access to that kind of equipment so that's the method i'm going to use for the bottom rails However, if you need a little bit of movement and adjustment later on, I'm gonna show you another method to attach these rails and I'll demo that on the top ones. So we've got a bit of an odd shaped cavity to fix these rails into. It's nice and square on the front, but we've got a step to remove here. Before sizing these rails, we'll just clamp the legs together front to back so that we can give ourselves an accurate measurement, which would be representative of what that final dimension should be. I'll just give these a tap to get them flush. So I'll just quickly cut and shoot these down to size to fit, and then we'll cut that little notch out the back corner. And when you're fitting these, I wouldn't go for like a really, really tight fit. You know, go for something that is snug, but still somewhat loose in there. Because the last thing you want is for these draw runners to be the reason preventing the mortise and tenons at the side from bottoming out. We want the shoulders on those side rails to bottom out before, because you're not even going to see this. So just get it so it fits nicely, but it's not like you're not having to compress it in there. Like this kind of thing is perfect. We, we can always trim it down afterwards because we're gluing these sides first, but we might as well get it good now. And so with four of the runners cut, now we've just got to cut out a little notch in one of the corners in order to wrap around that back leg. Again, we'll make this like as close as possible, but it doesn't need to be perfect. So it looks like I'm gonna to need to take a seven millimeter notch out of this, but I'll go seven and a half just to give me a bit of wiggle room. I'll set the gauge to 
just over seven. And I'll just check these rails to see if there's any like defects on them. Like if there was a dented corner or something, that's the one that I could notch out so that they're still nice and crisp. But these all look to be, these are all fine. So when doing this, we'll go over the end grain and also down the faces on both the top and the bottom. And then spin it 90 degrees with the same measurement, go over the side and then meet up with the lines that we just did. And that should give you a nice corner like that to remove. We could just leave this off the saw, but I'm gonna chisel back to the line. No reason for this other than, you know, you guys are watching. I need to make it look like I'm putting some effort into this thing. Okay, so I'm just gonna check the fit here. Fits nicely, but again, it's just like, it's snug, it holds itself, but I just don't want it resisting this mortise. So I could take a shaving off here because I've got a bit of room in the shoulder to kind of shift it down, or I could just do it at this end. So let's just give this a quick hit. That was literally one pass. There you go. But that's just gonna allow for a tiny bit of compression, even though this joint's already clamped. That should be perfect. So now I'm just gonna go around and number each of these draw runners so that we get them in the same location every time. You know, that was kind of a bespoke fit up here. It might be slightly different down the bottom. Yeah, so it's a tiny bit looser down the bottom and that's just down to minor discrepancies in places. And we can actually use our existing marking out for this. For example, on this top rail, we've got H for the dovetail. I'm just stick an H on here and we've got B. So we'll do B there. Okay, so now I've got them all marked out. I'm just gonna pop them back in, get them flush with the underside of these rails and check that if I do so, it ends up seamless. So what I'm feeling is flush on the underside of the rail, flush here. I know that if I fix this draw runner into position and it's flush with the underside of the rail, by the time we glue this whole table together, that should end up flush as well. So I'm happy with that. Just check the other side. And again, that is, it's like a tiny step on that one, but it's like barely perceivable. That could easily just be slightly adjusted with sandpaper. If needed, it might not even cause any issues, but we can do that after assembly. And so you can check that on the bottom as I just did and also do it on the top. If these draw runners are flush with the top of the side rails and still end up seamless on that front rail, then you can follow the process that I'm about to show you. If there is a slight bit of misalignment with both the bottom and the top rails, after I show you this first process, I'll show you how to do one that is more adjustable once the table is already assembled. It's quite a fun technique anyway. So first let's get this disassembled and I'll show you the easiest way to permanently fix these runners in position. So these are the side rails. I've gone ahead and numbered the inside faces as well so I can match that up with the draw runners. And basically all we've got to do is fix it in position so it ends up flush on the bottom. And there's a number of ways you could do that. Biscuits or dominoes being a really good one. Those machines are designed to make flush surfaces like this. So you might as well use it. And of course, to get access to the inside face, this is why we need to think about this now rather than glue it up and then try and get in here afterwards. So if you've got these machines, you might as well do that. But for me, and just to make it a bit more accessible to people, I'm gonna just simply glue and screw this in position, but make it look quite neat. So I'll just set a gauge up to half the thickness of one of these draw runners. Give myself a faint mark from either side, and then we'll need a couple of screws in this. So I'll just do it about an inch from either side. Next, we'll clamp it down very securely, and we'll make sure to get it flush on the bottom and the shoulder lines flush as well. Right, and before I get screwing this into position, I do want to quickly describe the difference between a pilot clearance and countersink. Because if you're going for maximum accuracy, there is a proper way of screwing screws into wood. And so this is how you do it. I'll draw a large screw on here, very rough. So we've got the head, we've got the shank, and then we've got the threads going down the length of it. When sizing your drill bits, you want the pilot to be the same size as the shank of the screw. Usually that's somewhere about two millimeters. And then for your clearance hole, you want that to be the same size or just slightly larger than the threads on the screw itself. Finally, the countersink is simply what gets the head of the screw below the surface of the wood. And so it's not gonna be unsightly and stuff. And so when we do this, we start again, we've got a side rail to screw into, we've got a draw runner, and then we've got the screw coming in from this direction. What we're going to do to begin with is drill a pilot hole through both of the pieces of wood while they're clamped in position. And so the hole in this and this is perfectly aligned. Then what we'll do is we'll remove this piece of wood and widen this one 
to the clearance hole. So this ends up being much wider and basically the screw is able to pass all the way through it without touching these edges. Now you might be wondering, well, what's the point in that? That's just, you're not gonna be able to fix these two pieces together. Well, that's where the head of the screw comes in and we countersink that in position so that effectively the screw passes all the way through the clearance hole. It bites into the side rails and as that descends, the head comes down and clamps this one in position. You might have experienced it in the past where you haven't done this clearance hole and when you screw things together, the pieces sort of temporarily separate and then come together. By having a clearance hole, that is what prevents this. If you just do it with a pilot hole, then you might end up with a small gap in the middle of these two components, or you might end up with some breakout on the inside of this drawer runner that's gonna cause a gap or misalignment or whatever. Doing it this way with a pilot clearance and then countersink hole is the proper way to do it. It's just a little bit more fussy. I've put a bit of tape around the drill bit. We're going quite deep with this, and I'm sighting along the drawer runner to make sure that I'm not sort of going in at any weird angle. So pilot holes in position, and these are going all the way through the draw runner into the side rail below. So next we'll remove the side rail and widen these two to a clearance hole. And just a quick note on this as well, if you've got a pre-existing hole that you need to widen, let's draw two here, the drill bit you choose to widen that hole is really important. In general, there's two types of drill bits. You've got a sort of normal ground point, conical point one like this, and then you've got lip and spur or brad point drill bits that sort of have a point on them. Generally, ones like this are better for drilling into wood because it scores the grain before cutting them. These ones can be a bit messy. However, in this case, if you're widening a hole, you want to be using one like this because that conical point is going to locate in the top. It's going to get it nice and centered, and then it's going to descend down while kind of guiding itself down that hole in the middle. Lip and spur bits or brad point drill bits like this can sometimes work but you might find that once this spike goes into the wood it doesn't locate very well and these spurs around the edge will sort of like chatter before bedding into the wood and there's a chance it could be completely off center like this and descend down or it could even sort of go off course if you were really misaligned. So generally you want to make sure if you're widening holes go for a conical pointed drill bit like this. So I'll just clamp this down to a piece of MDF to give it a nice backstop so we can minimize the breakout. Again, sight along the rail, get it located. Just do the other one real quick. When you do this, you want to start with really light pressure because the drill bit does kind of just grab and go. And if we've done this right, there you go. So you can see the screw doesn't engage in that hole whatsoever. There's actually a tiny bit of movement in it, which can be useful to us. And so finally, all we got to do to sink the heads in is countersink them. <laughs> to make sure you match the screw head diameter. What we should find is we can just put a screw straight through here. That will engage in the pilot holes below perfectly. And once we tighten these down, you can see they screw in almost effortlessly. No separation happening whatsoever. And most importantly, on the bottom, seamless. The advantage we do have here, however, is because we drilled those countersink holes slightly larger than the screw, not by much, we've actually got a tiny bit of movement on this if we need it. Now you're gonna need glue to kind of secure it in its final position because the countersink on the head of the screw will kind of force it to center itself in a set position, but we will have a tiny bit of movement. So you literally can't feel a step there whatsoever. That in itself is a reason to do a clearance hole. Not only does it make screwing the pieces of wood together easier and a bit more accurate, but if you size it slightly larger, that tiny bit of adjustment can be the difference between having a small step and something completely seamless to the point where you can't even feel any change in material there whatsoever. Of course, you don't need to do this every time you screw something together. Sometimes just a pilot hole suffices, sometimes just screwing it straight into wood suffices. But if you're going for maximum accuracy like you're doing here, that's the method to choose. Now, if I were you, I would hold off on gluing that for the time being, just fix it in position with screws because we still have got a bit of cleanup to do on the inside face and the top of the runner. And now that we've got these screws kind of pre-drilled and ready to go, we can fit these drawer runners after the assembly of the table has taken place. And so again, we can use that small amount of movement to our advantage to get it flush with the front rails. So I'll just quickly go through this process on the other rail at the bottom, get up to speed on that. And then I'll show you the technique for fitting these drawer runners if you need to account for a bit more movement than what this allows.
Okay, so if you're confident of the placement of the draw runners, that's the method to use. Screw it in position and then later on we'll add a bit of glue to it to add some strength to that screw joint because most of us know what it's like with furniture when screws and things come loose and it's just so hard to fix. Generally, you want to reinforce a screw joint with a bit of glue. However, if you are not confident on the placement of those draw runners and you want a bit more adjustment, the method we're going to be using is with threaded inserts. Now these get a little bit of a bad rep in fine furniture making at least because bolting something like this together is seen as a bit barbaric, which I can understand if it's not done tastefully. But in the case of this, it's going to be so hidden and we're going to nicely recess the heads in position. And not only is it hidden, but it's extremely functional. There's no debate that this is the way to go. And what's more, because we've got such a strong joint from this, we won't even need to glue it in position. So we've always got room for future adjustment if needed. And so that way we can get this a really, really fine tuned fit once the table is all together and make that draw fit perfectly. So this is how you install them. So bolting this in position will follow a very similar process to screwing it, but there's just a bit more planning ahead required. Firstly, you need to decide if you're happy for the bolt head to sit proud of the surface like this, or if you want to have it recessed. If you have it proud, you've got a little less planning ahead to do, but it's at the expense of a bolt kind of sitting proud of the surface. You know, in this case, it's going to be pretty much completely hidden, but you might not be so fortunate in other projects. And so if you're planning on recessing the head below the surface, not only does that kind of change the order in which we drill the holes out, but also you need to make sure the recess is large enough to fit a socket in for you to actually tighten it afterwards. That is something that I always forgot to do. I would recess the head and the washer into the wood and then realize, oh wait, I can't actually tighten it up because I can't fit this into the recess. So not only does the hole need to be big enough to fit the socket, but if you want any kind of adjustment on this whatsoever, the recess actually needs to be larger than the socket by whatever amount you need to adjust this by. If you need to be able to move it up or down two millimeters, that hole needs to be two millimeters bigger than the socket. So because it's the more difficult of the two processes, I'm gonna show you how to recess the head of these bolts in position while still allowing for a lot of up and down movement. But if you just wanna make this simple for yourself and have the bolt sitting proud of the surface, after watching this, you'll be able to figure out how to do it. So once again, I'm going to mark the midpoint on these draw runners so I can get this recess bang in the center. We're gonna to have to make the recess quite wide. So that measurement is really important. We'll measure in the same amount as before. So back to the paper. Now here we've got the side of the table, we've got the draw runner and we've got a bolt that needs to go into it. Much finer thread on this. So it's going to follow a very similar process and we're going to need to pile it through both of them. But then unlike screwing it where we widened this hole, we're actually going to need to keep this one at the same diameter as the bolt and widen this one down here in order to accept the much wider threaded insert that's going into it. The problem with piloting the hole like this first is this recess needs a flat base on it to suit the underside of the bolt and the washer that's going into it. But you may remember when widening holes with the screw, we had to use a bit with a conical point on it. The problem with that is that if we're widening this pilot hole to suit the underside of this bolt, it's not gonna end up with a flat bottom, it's gonna end up with a conical one like that. And not only is that gonna affect the clamping force of the bolt, but it's also gonna force it to self-center in that hole. And then we're not actually gonna get the adjustment that we're seeking from using this method. And so, let's start again. These pads are available on my website, by the way, they're really useful. If I draw it again, we've got the side, draw runner and bolt. What we actually need to use for this top one is either a Forstner bit or a lip and spur bit, as I described earlier when we were screwing it in position. What this will do is it will give us a hole that kind of has this sort of cross section on it. The diameter of this should be wider than that of the head of the screw. I've had to taper that because I drew it slightly off size. But the outside diameter of that hole needs to be wider than the bolt and the washer. And then what we can use is this point left over from the end of the drill bit to create the pilot hole, or I guess in this case it's a clearance hole, that is the same diameter as the threads on the bolt. That pilot hole is going all the way through. We then remove the material, widen this, to suit the threaded insert, bolt that in position, put it all together, bolt it all in place, and then that is this fixed in position. However, because this hole is the same diameter as the threads, it's not actually gonna be able to move side to side. And so what we can do is we can just incrementally increase the size of this hole so that it gives us a little bit more side to side adjustment each time until we get to a point where we're able to move it side to side enough. The only limitation you've got here is you don't want it to get so wide that you end up with nothing for the washer to lock onto at either side. If you need that much side to side adjustment, 
don't do this recessing method. You're just going to have to do it on the face, use a much larger bolt, a much larger washer and create a much larger clearance hole. So if you need to do this, just follow along and I'll show you step by step how to do it and how to kind of adjust the hole to suit the adjustment that you needed. It will make sense as we go forward. So I'm going to demonstrate this with a worst case scenario with recessing with a big drill bit that should allow me two millimeters of movement up and down. And just to reiterate, this adjustment is dictated by the width of the drill bit, not the overall length. This is just the only drill bit I had of the required diameter that had a brad point on the end. So that's the one that we're using. Remember, it could also be a forstner bit if needed as well. All we're looking for is a flat bottom on this recess. I'm gonna give myself a center mark to stop this drifting because I'm getting quite close to the edges with such a large drill bit. Okay, so that's what we're left with. Nice clean hole with a center point that we can continue descending with. So next we need to continue these holes down into the side rail. So the bolt we're using to attach this is an M3 bolt. That means the overall size of the threads are three millimeters. And so that's the size of the hole we're gonna drill through these runners into the side rail. Now, because this hole is the exact same size as the thread, it's not gonna give us any adjustment, but we can always widen it to suit. So we might as well start small and then gradually increase it as needed. So I've got some tape on the drill bit, it locates nicely in the middle. Sorry, I lied, I realized I'm actually using an M4 here. <laughs> So in fact, this hole needs to be four millimeters. That's better. Okay, now remove this rail, remove the runner. That's given us two points below. And so in here, this is where we're adding our threaded inserts. Now try and be really precise with the size of these holes. These threaded inserts tend to taper from bottom to top. And so you want the diameter of this hole to be the same size as the larger side of the taper, because otherwise you might round the heads on them, which is never fun. So that looks to be good. Bit of tape around the drill bit. And then it's usually a good idea with threaded inserts to not only deburr the hole, but just put a very small countersink on it to help these heads kind of sit flush with the surface of the wood. Otherwise you might end up sort of over tightening it to make it flush and you'll strip the head on it and it's just horrible to try and remove them. I always find putting just a little bit of candle wax on the threads helps these go in a little bit. And the key with these is to start off as level as you can. It is possible for them to sort of veer off course just bottom them out, don't over tighten them. And that now can thread straight in and we've got a lovely fixing into that wood that isn't gonna have the same issues that screwing does where that thread might strip. This is the primary reason I love using these inserts. It's just so much stronger and durable than a screw would be. And if you use a kind of bolt that hasn't got a hexagonal head on them, like maybe you've got a stainless steel Allen key head or a cross head or something on it. You can get all the advantages of a bolted point, but with the aesthetics that a screw might give you. <laughs> Mind you, I'm pointing at two Torx headed screws here. It's not like I've put much effort into them. So here is where we're currently at with things. So much like the screws, bolts go all the way through and don't engage in this first piece whatsoever. And then the threads will go down, engage in the threaded inserts, and then we've got the socket to tighten it up. Just do it by hand to begin with. And you can see, because we've drilled that hole, we can tighten this all the way to the bottom. And that is this fixed in position, perfectly flush on the top again. But that's not what we were hoping to achieve by doing this joint, because if I just loosen this off, we wanted sort of up and down adjustment. And so the way to do that, taking these out and widening these two holes. And remember, we don't want to widen these too much so that the washer doesn't have anything to clamp on. This is a five and a half millimeter drill bit. And if I drill the hole at that, that gives me an extra millimeter and a half of adjustment. So let's try widening it to five and a half to begin with. So again, we're using a conical pointed drill bit to self-center this. Get as much of that fluff out as we can. Now what you'll see is we've got a lot more adjustment 
up and down on this rail at both ends and we can also move it forwards and backwards ever so slightly as well. So what this means is when it's in situ and you get it flush with the front leg, you can just get up in there with a socket, snug these up in the places that you need. The access will probably be a bit restricted but you can still get it done. And that is going to really securely lock that draw runner in place and give you plenty of adjustment up and down. You can see that what this also does though is moves the bolt to one side of this recessed hole and if you have to adjust it really far it might not be possible to get your socket in to actually tighten it. So that's why it's a bit of a balancing act between making this hole wide enough in order to fit the socket in but not so wide that it ends up breaking through the surface. If you need this much adjustment side to side to the point where you can't get the socket in don't bother recessing it just have the bolt sit on the face of the surface, drill that hole nice and wide, put a big washer on it and then you'll have loads of adjustment up and down. And so that's two ways of attaching the draw runners. One having a sort of fixed position that you're happy with, the other one allowing for a bit of adjustment. And honestly there might be a case for doing a combination approach like I've done here because what I can now do with this top rail is when I'm fitting the drawer and I've got the sides nice and parallel, I can adjust this top runner to sit perfectly parallel with the one underneath so that I can get that drawer fitting perfectly from front to back. And so that's why why threaded inserts can be so useful in fine furniture making. So I've just gone ahead and got it all reassembled. Let's take a look at what we got. So the draw runners are nice and flush with the side rails. We've got a seamless step going on at the front here, but these screws did have a tiny bit of adjustment on them if needed, but we're not gonna need it in this case. And as for the top ones, again, they're feeling pretty good, but because we've done the widened bolts, we have got a tiny bit of movement on them if we need to kind of pinch it or open it at the front or back when it comes to fitting the drawer. And so the areas we need to focus on next are sort of filling out these inside areas so the drawer kind of goes in straight and doesn't dip into one of the back corners. But to be honest, I think I might hold off on these until after the table is assembled because it's easy enough to get access into there. They're going to be such low stress that really just a bit of glue is going to be all that's needed to hold them in place and I could probably just get away with using super glue for it to be honest. Right so we're going to stop things there for this video to keep things nice and succinct so in the next one we're going to be focusing on assembly. As always thank you very much for watching if you enjoyed it please don't forget to press the like button subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one.